Hello and happy Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th fans. Welcome to my review of the fourth installment in the Friday the 13th franchise, Friday the 13th, the final chapter, aka Friday the 13th part four. And yeah, basically, uh, um, for spoiler alert for any of you guys that, you know, haven't seen this movie, I'm sure all of you have. This is indeed not the final chapter, um, as there are plenty more Friday the 13th films to come. So it is a very poorly aged title, but the best way I justify the title is by calling it, by saying that it's probably, well, I consider it the final chapter of Human Jason and not Jason as a whole, because at this, after this point, Jason will, you know, become a zombie. Of course, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but that's how I justify, uh, justify this poorly aged title. So since this is during Scooby Month, I, I assume that last time I did a review of one of the new Scooby-Doo Movies episodes, which I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm recording this ahead of time, obviously, um, so I don't know which new Scooby-Doo Movies episode I reviewed, but I hope you guys did enjoy it. Normally, I would not do anything but Scooby-Doo reviews for this month. However, Jason Voorhees is my favorite slasher. And I cannot pass up the uh, can, I cannot pass up the opportunity to review one of his movies for Friday the Thirteenth, and it's become a tradition on my channel. So we can't we can't let this tradition die. We we got plenty of Jason content to review on Friday the Thirteenth. So today I'll be covering uh, Friday the Thirteenth: The Final Chapter, which was released on April Thirteenth, nineteen eighty four. The short synopsis of the film is, a carefree lakeside vacation is interrupted by the re-emergence of our favorite killer, Jason Voorhees. After he escapes from a morgue, leaving bodies in his wake, Jason travels to Camp Crystal Lake, where a group of friends are staying. The teens meet some locals, Tommy and Trish, as well as a secretive hiker, Rob. As the group of teenagers engages in drunken debauchery, their numbers begin to dwindle, and pieces of the past resurface. So as per usual, I'll of course be watching this film on the 8 movie box set uh, collection, uh, collection of the fr first 8 Friday the 13th films. It's a great box set, um, I definitely highly recommend it to fan Friday the 13th fans who want to, uh, you know, experience the first, uh, all the all the Paramount films. Um, they're all here on this nice little box set. They have some nice, good, goody special features, and it's pretty cheap, so it's not that much money. It, it, it's not much out of your wallet. And there's a lot of good special features that I will be covering, you know, uh, when I do my review of it. So we got commentary by director Joe Zito and screenwriter Barney Cohen and editor Joel Goodman. We also have a fan commentary by Adam Green and Joe Lynch. We have Lost Tales from Camp Blood Part 4. We have Jason's Unlucky Day, 25 years after Friday the 13th, the final chapter. We have Slash Scenes. We have The Lost Ending. We have The Crystal Lake Massacres Revisited Part 1. And we have Jimmy's Dead Dance Moves. And of course, there's also the original, original theatrical trailer on there as well. There's a lot of good goodies on here for uh, for us to tackle, and I'll be tackling um, all the special features after I go through the movie, and you know, uh, scene by scene, I will of course go over the special features and tell you guys which ones I you know prefer over others. As far as the reception for this film goes, from my experience, I believe most fans really love this film. This is considered one of the most highly regarded films in the Friday the 13th franchise. It's usually between this and part six. These two are rated the high highest when it comes to Friday the 13th. There are of course other minority people who will probably pick other you know, Friday the 13th films, but usually four and six are the top, con uh, the top two contenders most of the time uh, that are considered to be favorites. Uh, um, of the Friday the 13th franchise and I'll give my thoughts on part six when I get there but why don't we take a look at this film to see whether I consider it my favorite of the franchise and whether I truly believe with the you know and agree with the fans if this is you know one of the best films in the franchise or whether it's you know maybe overrated so 
Let's take a look at the film to see whether I think it is a good or bad Friday the 13th film. The movie begins the same way the last two movies did, with another fucking pointless recap of the of the la of the last movie. However, unlike part two and three that just went over the last movie, the final chapter does something pretty good and unique and different, which is that it splices together the last three movies and has Paul um, do has the scene of Paul at the campfire telling the tale of Jason, while you see clips from various of the fir various you know scenes of the first three movies and it kind of is like a really good tone center and a good like overview of the series at that point that honestly you don't even need to watch the first three movies and you could be well informed about uh, you know about Jason just by diving into the final chapter it's a it's probably the best of the recaps it doesn't it doesn't spend like spend way too long on like scenes from the previous movies it just kind of does like a quick montage to get people up to speed who forgot the last three movies or you know haven't seen the last three movies then we properly begin the movie co-tailing off the ending of part three where we see a joint police and paramedic operation at the crystal crystal lakes higgins haven property as we see the bodies of, of all the several teenagers from the last movie are placed in ambulances after the massacre of the previous evening. The victims' families are all at the hospital mourning their loss. Included with the bodies is the hideously deformed Jason Voorhees, the killer of the last two movies. After having been hit on the head with an axe at the end of the previous film, he's mistaken as one of the dead bodies and taken to the West Wessex County Morgue. After we meet Mr. Sleazeball himself, the Axel, who's the uh, coroner, um, being uh, sleazy to like uh, uh, one of the nurses on the night duty, uh, I think her name is Nurse Robbie, we then see that later that night Jason wakes up and kills the coroner Axel Burns by slitting his throat with a fucking surgical hacksaw and snapping his neck while he's watching some, I don't know, like old style, like porn maybe or something to get off of i don't know <laughs> then jason next goes to nurse robbie morgan who is soon gutted after with a scalpel by jason as he makes his escape back to crystal lake we then get introduced to three of uh, uh three of the protagonists that will be following throughout this movie the jarvis family trish jarvis the sister and daughter of the family tommy jarvis the youngest uh and a son of the family and the only boy of the house, and their mother, um, you know, their mother who's the head of the house. And then we get introduced the following afternoon to a group of teenagers driving to Crystal Lake, which is our usual Friday the 13th slaughter fodder for a weekend getaway. Having rented the house at the edge of the forest, which is the house right across from the Jarvis family. So we got a new, you know, we got a new batch of teen fodder. So, and we got the Jarvis family who are our like emotional anchor for this film, the people that you know we're, we really care about. Although I will say there there probably are some people in the group that we do care about and there are standouts in the group. But the group consists of Paul and his girlfriend Samantha. Yes, there's another fucking Paul. Um, my name is seems to be very common in these Friday the 13th movies. Uh, He's not he's not as good as the last Paul. Paul from part 2 is much better than uh, than this Paul. This Paul is uh not not the best of pe uh, people. I'll say that. You got Doug and Sarah who are mutually attracted to each other. The jokester named Ted who's, you know, kind of like the guy who wants to get laid and is also the jokester. And then, besides Ted, who's uh, the, uh, one of the memorable ones, we got Jimmy, which you'll come to find out why he's memorable later on in the film, besides him being played by Kristen Glover, who Ted bullies over the, his recent breakup and, you know, makes fun of him for it. As they approach Crystal Lake, they take brief notice of Pamela Voorhees' gravestone, which says that she died in 1979. Which, I don't know if that's supposed to be the actual thing or an error, because it does, like, kind of reinvigorate, it kind of does, you know, reinvigorate that debate of when the original Friday the 13th actually takes place. I still believe it was in 1980. I think it was just an error. 
Um, but, you know, some people believe otherwise, so. And then soon after that, they find a hitchhiker who's a, hi a fat hippie hitchhiker who holds out a sign asking for a ride. But without any room in their car, they continued onwards and pass her, and she flips him off after Ted makes a remark towards her. And then we get a, a fantastic scene of Jason walking up behind the, the woman and thrusting a knife through her neck, killing her. The Banana Girl death is honestly the most iconic of this not only uh, of kills in this franchise but one of the best of this movie it's so amazing how a character that really doesn't have that much screen time and doesn't really say anything has one of the more memorable kills but it could be just how creative it is we all she's eating a fucking banana getting her throat you know getting a knife through her throat easily one of the best scenes in the film i love it The teenagers leave their car to hike through the woods in search of their cabin, and they meet local twins, Tina and Terry, as, they enjo as they're enjoying a bike ride. So besides Sarah, who goes off and wanders back to the car, Ted, Jimmy, and the others go skinny dipping in the lake, because of course they do, and the teenagers' neighbors for the weekend, Trish and Tommy Jarvis, drive by while heading back from the store. Some of the groups are familiar with Trish and invite her to their party later that night, However, Trish is more concerned about sh shielding Tommy's excited eyes from the nudity in front of him and goes and continues driving after that. So their car breaks down further into the forest and what does Trish decide to do? Have her fucking little brother take care of the mechanical things. Yes, because this young boy f uh, somehow knows how to do uh how to fix a car. Like, okay, Trish, like even though even though he do, he looks capable, it should not be his job to do that. However, thankfully they receive help from the final uh, protagonist of this film that we uh, that we meet, which is Rob, a stranger who claims to be hunting for bears, despite Tommy's objection to to such animals being in the area at all. Rob helps them with the car, gets it started. They get, and they you know they give him a ride to where you know in into the forest. As a show of gratitude, Trish drives Rob to her house, and there he is briefly introduced to the estranged Mrs. Jarvis, and Ch Tommy shows him his homemade Halloween mask before he heads out to set up camp. And it's basically like a good way of like Tommy, like, you know, showing off his, like, you know, his design stuff, you know, like, and also Tom Savini's, you know, and others, you know, the, you know, the costume people's, you know, mask <laughs> trish and tommy then head out again to buy some more goods and as the night falls the teenagers begin their party and in the come in the company of their guests tina and terry and when jimmy goes up to start to dance with one of the twins oh boy he does this dance what the fuck am i looking at i i've heard apparently this is actually something crispin glover did at nightclubs and that that's how he actually danced but it is a fucking weird ass dance i don't know what this is but at the same time it's kind of amazing how ridiculous it is that i can't turn my eyes away from it it definitely livens up the scenes with the teenagers i'll say that As the group gets acquainted with some slow dance music, Samantha becomes angry with Paul when he shows no reluctance to dance with one of the twins. So to ease her frustration, she, she heads outside to go skinny dipping and tells Paul about it, saying, Come along, 
I'm gonna go skinny dipping if you wanna, you know, that's where you'll find me. Hoping that'll come. Noticing a raft floating in the lake, she swims out to it to relax, waiting for Paul to arrive. And once she's finally given up that he's probably not gonna st show up, she gets stabbed underneath the raft through the stomach by Jason from underneath. At the party, Paul starts to feel guilty and heads outside to check up on Samantha. When he does, he finds her body in the raft and Paul frantically swims back to the shore to seek help. And then, oh fuck, he gets impaled but through the groin with a spear by Jason who was hiding under the pier. Oh. Not uh, this is one of the more like the worst deaths of uh, uh, this movie and maybe even the entire franchise. Like that's the one area you don't want to fucking get stabbed in. And the fact that this guy is the same name as me and he get he gets like the fucking one of the worst deaths in the franchise with a fucking spear to his his groin is fucking awful. It makes me whinge every time. It makes me appreciate my nutsack more. <laughs> Rob hears Paul's screams and he heads through the woods to investigate. He finds nothing, but he returns to find Jason has entered his tent and has made and ransacked it and made a mess of it. He destroyed his he basically just destroyed his gun though and just left. Then back at the party, Jimmy and Tina hit it up and develop an attraction, much to the annoyance of Ted, because who's increase who's increasing desperation, you know, compels him to Terry and uh, the others to win. And Jimmy and, Tina, uh, Jimmy and Tina head upstairs to have sexy time in Paul's room, leaving Terry with Ted. Not that Paul's going to matter since, you know, he just fucking lost his dick just a couple seconds ago. After finding a vintage stag film, Ted sets up a film projector so he, Terry, Doug, and Sarah have something fun to watch. So now I'm put off by, from Ted completely, Terry gives up and gets ready to leave. She gets into a brief argument with Tina when she's trying to get her to leave with her, uh, basically cock blocking or, or, uh, her sister. Um, but she just tells her sister, leave me alone, you know, head home by yourself. And she's forced to leave the house alone. This in turn gives Jason the perfect opportunity to strike. We don't actually see it, uh, you know, on screen, although the lightning shows it, where she gets impaled with the same spear that was used to kill Paul, which, uh, and then gets, you know, thrown to the side of the house, stuck on it, basically. Soon after, Jason kills Mrs. Jarvis next door as she heads outside to investigate her house's son and power loss, and, you know, is wondering where everybody everybody is you know where where's her daughter her her son you know she, i guess they didn't tell her their their kids didn't tell her that she they were gone they're going to leave um but yeah mrs jarvis gets killed and we don't actually see her death she just you know has a face of shock and then die you know dies off screen there is something you know in the special features that shows that there was going to be an overt thing of of showing her uh that she did in fact die i mean obviously i'm pretty sure most likely she's dead it's very much implied but i think the director said he didn't feel think it was right to kill her off and you know who might argue with that you know it's not that necessary we already got enough kills with the team slaughter fodder so unaware that three of her friends are all dead doug and sarah finally decide to begin their sexual relationship and go upstairs to the shower so we're having sexy time everywhere. One in the bedroom, one in the fucking shower. And as Jimmy and Tina finish having their sexy time, Jimmy sneaks downstairs to tease Ted with her underwear, you know, because Ted was, was basically being pricked the whole time, thinking that he was going to get laid. But, you know, he ended up not getting anyone, which is fair because he was he's a douchebag. Though Ted is pretty much drunk enough to uh, with alcohol to not really give a shit, so he doesn't care. And as Jimmy goes into the kitchen to get another bottle, Jason sneaks into the house and Jimmy asks where the corkscrew is from Ted 
in a very drunken state. He sounds slurred when he says it. And Jason gives him the corkscrew by stabbing it with the corkscrew through his hand, followed by burying a fucking meat cleaver in his head, too. Oh boy, what a fantastic Jeff Jimmy had. Jason sure helped him out. What a great guy. Ted, where's, where's that, uh, that corkscrew, that fancy corkscrew for the wine bottle? Ted? We then cut back to upstairs where Tina's getting dressed and she notices Terry's bicycle is still parked outside. Very concerned about what's going on with her sister, she moves closer to the window to look for her sister, wondering if she's still out there waiting for her in the rain. And holy fucking shit, Jason just breaks through the goddamn uh, glass of the window and throws her onto the teen's parked car, killing her on impact. I mean, holy shit, Jason. you. I mean, I love that you're going all in, but can you slow it down a little bit? I'm trying to keep up with all these kills here. Damn, I think he's pissed off that this is his last movie. Next door, Trish and Tommy return from wherever the fuck they were going, uh, you know, coming from, from uh, and find the house empty. Trish heads outside to Rob's tent to see if he has done anything to do with, you know, their mother's disappearance or what, you know, what's going on. Uh, and Rob returns and almost kills her with a machete, thinking that she was Jason again. So he came prepared this time, hoping to ambush Jason. And then he finally explains to Trish the real reason he's in the forest. He wants to avenge his younger sister Sandra and her boyfriend Jeff, who, if you recall, were both characters that were killed in Friday the 13th Part 2 by Jason several days earlier. And that, though cons considering this takes place in one weekend, Rob took, I guess, two days to mount a, like, to mount a counterattack against Jason to hunt for him, uh, it is a stretch. But in, but since the since the movies you know were released far farther than that, you know you can I guess you can you know try to think of it in your own hand. Yeah, it's it's a weird timeline with this whole weekend thing. They could have just sparsed it each year rather than. Jason coming back like the next fucking day. They didn't need to do that, but oh well, that that's the timeline, so you can't do anything about it. If you remember, you know, Sandra and Jeff were impaled in the in the bed by Jason, which was awesome. I love that kill. Trish is very adamant that Jason's dead, but with the area oddly quiet around the, there, she can't really get rid of her doubts, and Rob is, you know, telling her, "I don't Jason is alive." There's two people at the hospital missing. You know, it's very quiet around this area. You know, with rowdy teenagers next door, you think you would hear them. And, you know, you can't find your mom. Like, there's clearly something going on here. Like, he, I don't... And, they, and he's right, you know. Jason is back, and he's still alive. But we cut back at the rental home where Jason re-enters the building. Very quickly, I might add... To, to kill Ted, luring him to the projector screen by cutting one of the re reels, and he stabs him through the head from behind the uh, from the projector screen. Jason's on a roll right now. I, he's on he's on his A game. He's not messing around. So let's keep the streak going, Jason. He's not done yet though. Upstairs, Sarah finishes her shower with Doug to get dressed, and as she's dyeing her hair, Jason walks upstairs. And Doug thinks it's a, it's a, at first thinks it's Sarah, then he thinks it's uh, Paul, uh, but it turns out to be not either of them. It's just Jason, and he smashes his hand through the glass and Doug's head against the bathroom wall, and ha and you know basically crushes him to get death against it, which is fucking awesome and a great effect. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sarah then returns to find him dead and begins panicking and calling out the names of the others for help. She runs downstairs, and as Sarah's desperately trying to get through a locked door, Jason throws a fucking axe through it and fatally strikes her in the chest, ending his amazing streak of these te- of killing these teens. Well, it was a great run, Jason. You did a you you know what? You're going very you're doing very well for your la- uh, for your supposed last movie. So good job. After checking if Tommy's okay, Trish, Rob, and the family dog Gordon run over to the rental house to check on the teenagers. When they when you know they find that the you know they can't call you know anyone uh, in the house and they and mom, they realize that their mother hasn't returned, they go to see you know check on the teenagers to see what's going on over there. They find the house oddly empty for teen for a house filled with rowdy teenagers. And Rob and Trish first decide to check the basement. But Trish decides to, to leave to head upstairs while leaving Rob in the basement. And after something frightens Gordon all, so much, Gordon jumps out of a window and runs away, never to be seen again. And <laughs> thankful, I've heard people debate whether Gordon actually died in this movie or not. I personally don't think he died. I, I don't like the idea that this dog died. I really hate the idea. Originally, apparently, there was... I guess there was plans to make it, uh, you know, very clear that Jason was the one that killed the dog. Thankfully, they didn't do that. And it's kind of just up to you to decide whether you think the dog isn't dead. I don't think it's dead. I think it just ran away and Jason didn't care about it. Because Jason killing dogs is not his character. And I, and I don't, uh, you know, that that's more of a Michael Myers type of thing, not Jason. So no, I don't think, I don't think the dog is dead. Yes, it was a second story window, but we see Trish jump out the same fucking height and she somehow survives. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that the dog probably survived. Upstairs, Trish finds Doug's body in the shower with the shower, uh, you know, and it's still running. And she finally is forced to admit Jason is alive. And Trish runs back down to Rob screaming that he's here. But at, in a, and, you know, Rob... And, the, and him uh, and Trish decide to head up, but as they're heading back up the stairs, the stairs collapse, causing Rob to drop his knife and or, or machete. Uh, I, I think it's knife. Um, and he goes, ba- he runs uh, back down to go get it. And Jason takes full advantage of this and gets into a scuffle with Rob. With Rob saying, "He's killing me! He's killing me!" You know, kind of like that. You know, and it was, and it was. It was very much over because I guess, like, you know, the director, you know, had probably, I guess, heard a story one time that somebody did say that while they, while somebody was killing them. So it, it's pretty unique. Also, I'll, I'll say that, you know, he's, he's fucking narrating his own death, which is quite sad that Rob, you know, ends the movie this way. But, you know, somebody, uh, I guess, you can't have three survivors. Somebody else has to get killed. I would have liked if they all three survived, but oh well. Knowing that, you know, she really wouldn't be much of a help anyways, Rob basically urges Trish to get away and run away while she has the chance before he, of course, meets his demise. And what does Trish decide to do with Rob screaming frantically that he's being killed and telling Trish to run? She heads up the stairs a little bit, faces the doorway and then fucking goes back down wondering if rob is dead yes he's fucking dead we just heard him and J- and you know she then runs up back upstairs and jason tries to grab her and you know try and you know and tries to kill her but thankfully she has the machete and finally uses it but it's like come on trish you know make up your mind are you you know <laughs> What are, you, what are you doing here? You gotta make your decisions here. It's life or death in, the, in this case. Still, I don't hate Trish as a final girl. I'll talk about her later. But I think, you know, she's she she's she's good. And, like, every final girl has moments of stupidity. So this was just Trish's moment of stupidity. Not knowing where she, what she, where she was supposed to go. I guess maybe she was in denial on whether Rob was dead and wanted to feel like she was doing something. I have no clue. So, but Trisha eventually runs out of the house. Well, she tries to two ways. She tries the front door and sees a body laying out. And rather than jumping over that, which is another stupid thing, she just kind of runs to the back door and then realizes Jimmy's 
tied like like <laughs> like with the with nailed his two hands are nailed, uh, and his whole body is blocking the door, which is really cool. So she can't out get out that way, and she decides to break a window and go out that way. You really couldn't jump over the body, Trish? Come on now. And with and with Rob's machete in her hand, she runs home to start nailing the door shut when she gets back home with Tommy. And the reinforced door does a little bit of help, but not by much. Like, it's, it's a nice idea, but... It's fucking Jason. Of course he's going to come through that door. And Jason does his classic corpse toss to the fucking window by throwing Rob's corpse through the window. Um, but he doesn't actually go through the window. Instead, he, try, he... Well, I think he does at first. Or at least he tries to kill Tommy through another window not not too far away from that window that he threw the cor Rob's corpse through. Uh, but Trish, you know, stabs him and gets him off, and then he decides to go through the door and fucking rams through it and is able to get through it with ease, so showing that nailing the door shut didn't do jack shit. And once he gains entry, Jason gets inside and he throws a fucking hammer at Trish, which just barely misses her by inches. He is pissed. He is not fucking around. He wants this girl dead. <laughs> And I mean, to be fair, you know, it's his final movie. He's got no other teens left to kill. He's upset that he has no more fodder to kill. He wants to get the job done. He wants to get these fuckers off. He wants to kill them. So Trish and Tommy run upstairs into Tommy's room and they and they try to reinforce his door as well with, you know, by putting his shelf up against the door to see if that'll block it. It kind of does a little bit of uh, a little bit of blocking the door, but it doesn't do that much. Because of course, Jason starts hacking at the door down with his axe, prompting Trish to get you know uh, Tommy's computer monitor and smashing it over Jason's head once he starts to gain entry into the into the doorway and moving the uh, shelf out of the way. And it looks like Trish had succeeded for a little bit, but. No, so th this is Jason, and Jason's just screwing around with her. He wakes the fuck back up, and his w and his regenerative powers gets him right back up, and he's not down for long. But the time he is out, Trish uses it for her advantage, and you know tries to sneak past. And once he does wake up, she tries to lure Jason away from Tommy, giving him the the chance to escape, giving him time to escape while she lures him to the rental back to the rental house. For another fucking chase. When Tommy tries to go after both of them and on his way out, he sees he finds some of Rob's newspaper clippings on Jason, specifically the picture of Jason as a little kid, and he reads on how Ginny overcame Jason in part two. So this bringing an idea for him, Tommy decides to do something very similar, which is actually just as cool. It's not as good as Ginny's. I say Ginny's is much smarter, but it is a nice idea. Which is, Tommy begins shaving his ha hair in the hopes that he resembles Jason as a child, which will hopefully confuse him. Nice idea, and we'll see how it works, but meanwhile, we see, we cut to Trish, who returns to uh, Slasher Ground Zero in the, in the house, and is weakened after she jumps out the second story window of the rental home and lands on her back. Jason not sure is not sure that she's dead, but he's going to go finish the job anyways. And yes, Trish ends up being alive, which further, you know, makes me think that Gordon is most likely alive. You know, if she can survive a fucking fall like that, he can too. When she run, uh, when she walks back to the house, Tommy, you know, makes his presence still known. This obviously distresses Trish as she did all that basically for nothing as. Tommy did not use this to his advantage to run away. And Jason enters the home once again at a, and a tired tr tr uh, Trish dodges uh, well, she doesn't she does uh, she actually doesn't. Uh, she swings the machete multiple times at him, sensing that his presence is uh, her his presence behind her. She then gets a good shot on his left hand and splits it right down the middle in half and pierces his chest a little. And the fucking cut through the hand is really gnarly and awesome. This damage obviously doesn't do much to Jason though because he's Jason Voorhees. 
And he continues advancing towards Trish. And as Jason begins strangling Trish, Tommy runs downstairs completely bald and calls out to him. And the plan does actually work as he does confuse Jason into thinking he's a little kid. It's not as cool or, uh, or you know, makes as much sense as his mother, you know, Ginny dressing up as his mother and tricking him. But I'll buy it. I, I think it's a neat idea of Jason looking at a mirror of himself or seeing himself in Tommy. And Jason is, you know, focused on Tommy as he was when Ginny pretended to be Pamela. And this gives Trish enough time to swing the machete again at him. But it only scrapes Jason's fa face and cuts off his hockey mask and, re and reveals his face just like in every movie, and Trish is horrified by Jason's deformed face, and that face is cr really great, and drops the machete, giving him an opportunity to finally kill her. However, to protect his sister, Tommy grabs the machete that Trish had, uh, and instead drives it into Jason's skull, which finally uh, does enough, uh, gets, you know, does the job, as he finally collapses from it, furthering the blade further into his head and it's really cool that Jason you know gets stuck you know Tommy gets the machete on his head and it slides down his eyeball it's fucking crazy believing it to be all over Tommy and Trish you know embrace each other hugging you know being like you know it's finally over happy that it is however Tommy sees Jason's hand twitch and does the very smart thing that not many other survivors do, do and he grabs the machete and whacks at him repeatedly and keeps shouting die 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 over and over again as Trish hysterically screams at Tommy to stop but why should he stop you know make sure this motherfucker's dead you know you want to you want to get the job done Tommy's not screwing around this guy is trying to kill you you know can't take any chances. The film then cuts to day, some days later where Trish is recovering on a hospital bed and she's talking to the doctor about what happened to Tommy and how she's worried that something might be up with him because he kept repeatedly uh, whacking at Jason. However, the doctor assures her that there was nothing abnormal in, behave, in, her behave, in his you know, behavior and that he was, it, was, it was natural of him to fight back against Jason and protect, you know, his sister and make sure that he died. They then bring in Tommy at, with his hair slowly regrowing and he enters the room and the two of them reunite and hug once more and the film ends with the camera then cutting to Tommy who's looking back at the camera with a cold stare implying maybe he'll be the next Jason. Yeah, you'll, we'll see how that goes in the next film. I'm glad, personally, I'm glad that never happened. That's the end of the film, but now let's go on to the special features. And there are plenty of special features in the Friday the 13th final chapter. Uh, the first, we have commentary by director Joseph Zito, screenwriter Barney Cohen, and editor Joel Goodman. So they give their insight into the film and all the, you know, all the stuff while going through the film. And, of course, out of everything, uh, I especially loved how they gave us uh, to, uh, some... Uh, talked about the audition process of the Banana Girl. Um, and I know, I know, like, you know, it's weird out of all things I picked the Banana Girl, but I can't help it. That, that the Banana Girl is so iconic and her death is so iconic that it's just amazing that that minute of a character gets <laughs> some level of you know detail and backstory by you know uh by the director and the screenwriter and the editor about you know the casting process and all that even a small character like her i remember that we had the script was fat girl eating a banana you know so they this character was named fat girl and then i asked barney to do a 
you know, draft of the script where we didn't call her Fat Girl. So when we cast it, the actors coming in wouldn't see that they were coming up for the part of Fat Girl. So Barney does this and renames her and gives her a character name. So, of course, during casting, the casting director has it wrong and she has the wrong draft and she gives her the Fat Girl thing. And I try to, you know, cover and, 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 and I'm bluffing my way through it and she says, that's okay. I know, it's Fat Girl. That's what I came in for. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have some fan commentary by Adam Green and Joe, uh, Joe Lynch. So this is actually really cool because we get two commentaries. One about, you know, from the director, screenwriter, and editor of the movie. And then just a fan commentary, you know, from, uh, you know, guys like Adam Green and Joe Lynch who are in the business, but, you know, are fans of Friday the 13th and are talking about the final chapter, which is one of their favorites. And it's really cool to hear, you know, that from them. So you, you got two commentaries to go uh, to watch, and it's really cool. Then, as per usual, we have Lost Tales from Camp Blood Part 4, which is honestly pretty lame. It's a lame short film. Um, it's set in the hospital, which I guess is a nice change of setting. But the guy that, you know, is after them is so clearly, like... You know, just a guy in a hood. Like, it is menacing, a guy in a hood with an axe, but... And it's not a bad setting, but, you know... I, I kind of thought that maybe these, like, short films would have, you know, at least somebody... Even if it was a bad, like, Jason getup, at least, like, some type of Jason thing. And this guy does not look at all like Jason. He's just some guy that's, you know, in a hood and is going after this other guy and yeah it's not that impressive of a short film i was hoping for like an actual jason short film and that didn't deliver on it but it's there if you want to see it then we have jason's unlucky day 25 years after friday the 13th the final chapter and that and this one a special feature basically talks to you know different people that were involved in the making of the movie the actors and actresses the director, you know, all of them, uh, you know, uh, Tom Savini even talk, uh, gets some interview in them and they basically just talk more about the movie, the, you know, the behind the scenes stuff. And it's really cool. Uh, they look back at it after, you know, 25 years after the film has been released and look back on it. One cool thing is that Bonnie Hellman, who put, pl who plays the banana girl, I, I know I keep bringing her up, but again, they interview her about the banana girl and it's really cool because again the banana girl doesn't have any lines she's just the throwaway character that gets killed and yet we get so much about her and i love every second of it so it's definitely i when i saw that interview i was genuinely surprised but i was thrilled to hear from the banana girl girl herself about what it was like filming that scene Tom sat down and went through with me exactly physiologically what would happen if I was being stabbed through the throat, that it would pierce the voice box, that, you know, all the things that it would go through and what would happen to you, what would happen to your voice, so that I could incorporate that as an actor. He had his hand on my head, but you will be absolutely safe, but don't fight me. Then we have slash scenes, which are basically silent outtakes that director Joseph Zito takes us through. That he found he he found these on like old film reels uh, that that were just lying around, I guess, in Paramount. And it was really cool to see these, you know, outtakes, even though they didn't have any audio. That director uh, Joseph Zito walked us through it and talked about, you know, the context of these outtakes. Then we have the lost ending, which goes over the original ending of the film that they uh, decided to do. However, they scrapped it and ended up going for a different ending, um, which is basically the, you know, the ending is Tristan Tommy waking up, I believe, in, on the couch. You know, uh, I think they hear the police, uh, you know, so the police had finally arrived and uh, it was supposed to mirror the dream sequence of the first three movies and that ended up not happening which is probably for the best we didn't need another dream sequence again like the last three movies it was nice to change up the ending and just give us you know the ending at the hospital after tommy whacks jason a bunch of times 
still though it's an interesting watch uh definitely check it out if you if you're interested in it then we have the crystal lake massacres revisited part one which is an odd piece i it, it's kind of like it's a fake documentary that you know goes over you know kind of like a fake documentary about you know if jason was real and you know and were and you know people were actually interviewed about it so it's kind of like if you know if jason was real what a documentary of that would look like you know uh, um it's interesting um and and i uh, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where uh part two will go off but yeah, then we have Jimmy's Dead Dance Moves, which is basically um, goes over the scene, the outtakes of that scene of Jimmy dancing like a weirdo. <laughs> the iconic scene of J Jimmy dancing as a weirdo. And it's pretty it's pretty fun to see that iconic scene, uh, you know, all the outtakes of it and how the how the other actors couldn't really keep a straight face and you know i honestly don't blame him because like how can you keep a straight face when you see Grant crispin glover dancing <laughs> looking like he ha he's having a seizure on the dance floor then of course we have the original theatrical trailer which is great and then finally we for some reason have a preview for another movie on a separate dvd i don't know why uh there's never been any previews on the previous three movies so i have no idea why we have a preview on this unrelated horror movie but i guess maybe they just maybe they just decided to throw it in um who knows um yeah the, so that that's really all the special features i probably would say uh give the commentary by the director uh screenwriter and editor a watch because i think that's a good one um fan commentary is pretty good great as well uh i like jason's unlucky day 25 years after friday the 13th the final chapter um i enjoy the slash scenes and the lost ending and uh jimmy's dead dance moves was also great as well and the original theatrical trailer so lots of goodies there um not too many bad ones but you know give them all a watch if you're or give the ones whichever ones you're interested in and now let's get get into my final thoughts on the film and what I what I'm gonna rank it. I'm going to give Friday the Thirteenth the final chapter five stars out of five. So yeah, this is a pretty perfect movie in my eyes. I feel like this movie really can do no wrong. It's the, really a fantastic Friday the Thirteenth movie. I do have some minor negatives, so I'll start off with those just to get them out of the way. Full disclosure, these minor negatives don't really affect my enjoyment of the movie. They're just some gripes that I have that could have made it per more perfect, but the, it doesn't affect my enjoyment of the movie overall. It's still a 5 out of 5 movie. First off, I think some of the characters individually are weak, such as Mrs. Jarvis, Paul, Doug, and the twins Terry and Tina. They play off the other characters well, and all the characters have great dynamics with each other, but I feel like, you know individually mrs jarvis paul doug um and the twins tina and terry don't really get any sort of much growth you know individually um you know uh you could argue for some of them like with paul like you know making his de his, his decision to stay with um samantha and you know not cheat on one of the twins i guess is good kind of growth and uh, but, I mean, besides that, I mean, I feel like none of them really grow individually as characters. But I feel like that's okay because they have good relationship growth with the other characters. So I feel like there's not real. It's not that there isn't anything there. It's just individually they weren't as fleshed out as maybe they could have been. But that's okay. They work fine in the movie. A mother another minor negative is that I feel like they didn't really do enough with Rob's character. Not necessarily that his character was bad, because I loved Rob's character, and I actually felt like they did a good job with his character. I just felt like there could have been more done with his character, more they could have explored this idea of uh, one of a past victim's relative coming back to hunt down, you know, their kill, uh, the killer of their relative, is a pretty good idea i like that idea i just felt like they didn't really explore it more because by the time rob came face to face with jason 
he died right then and there. There was no show off. You know, I actually would have liked it if Rob survived the movie because it could have, you know, it maybe would have been cluttered having three survivors, but I would have liked it and it could have built on more and had they done and it could they could have built on that in future movies. I know this was planned as the final movie, but clearly they didn't follow through with that. So they could have explored that in future movies with Rob, you know, kind of being the, you know, uh, the yin to Jason's yang, you know, the Dr. Loomis uh, to Michael Myers, you know, his rival. But they didn't really do that, and they kind of had a missed opportunity there. But still, I love Rob as a character. They did a great job with him in the movie. And my final minor negative is that I really do not like that Jason makes grunts uh, and, you know, and various noises throughout the movie. They're few and far between, so they're not as annoying as they were in Part 3. But they're there, and they're worth pointing out. Um, and I don't, I don't think that... F it doesn't bother me too much, but it doesn't... F like I said in Pride of the 13th Part 3's review... I don't think it's necessary for Jason to do that. I feel like you should just, you know, you should just show the pain, but we don't need to hear Jason grunting or groaning in pain. Just show it, and we know he's in pain. That's all I got for minor negatives, though, so I think it's about time we go on to the positives of this movie, The big, uh, a big list of positives. What makes this movie so fantastic? Well, I'll start with the teenage characters, since I've already discussed them previously, but I feel like the stronger ones, I enjoyed all the teenage characters, but the strongest ones were Samantha, Sarah, Ted, and of course, Jimmy. I feel like they were the strongest individually, and I think they were also strong with each other. They played off each other well, had great chemistry, and this is because, you know, Samantha is kind of like the one who is the girl who kind of sleeps around a lot, you know, the more experienced girl. Sarah is the more recluse, shy girl and is trying to break out of her shell with, you know, Doug and, you know, start and stir a romantic relationship with him. Ted is the douchebag of the movie and, you know, and eventually Jimmy, um, who is the most eccentric character in the film with Crispin Glover's fucking dance, which is amazing, by the way. Uh, but Jimmy grows, you know, from his breakup and, you know, proves Ted wrong by saying that he's not a dead fuck because he's able to get with one of the twins and, you know, kind of, you know, proves the, and, and it's pretty satisfying because Ted's a douche. I also really like Tommy and Trish, our final duo as protagonists. I think they were a great sibling pairing. They were fantastic t together. Trish was one of the more better final girls because she put others and her brother's safety over hers. She was more concerned about everybody else's safety than her own, especially after Rob died. And yeah, she had her moments of stupidity, but I don't think that ruined her character. Every final girl is going to have, you know, her moments of stupidity. And plus, she did fight back against Jason. She uh, uh, had plenty of moments to shine throughout the end of the movie, so... While she had her stupid moments, every final girl's going to have that. It's just inevitable. And when, like I said, when you're in a horror situation like that, you're bound to make stupid mistakes. You're bound to do something that's very stupid. So I don't think it ruins her character overall. And Corey Feldman's Tommy was a very good uh, final boy. He was fantastic. This is the beginning of the Tommy Jarvis trilogy, so it'll be interesting to see how he grows throughout the films. I've seen each film one time, so... It's, well, besides the final chapter, I've seen it multiple times. But it'll be interesting to see how he grows, because it's been a while since I've seen Part 5 and Part 6. But Tommy's a very, very relatable kid in this movie because he's kind of like that nerdy outcast kind of kid. He's not really that popular. You know, they don't showcase that, but you can tell from his character that he's not the kind of kid that at his school that would be looked up to. And we understood and sympathize, and he understood and sympathized with Jason in this movie and even pulled uh, a Ginny from part two by trying to, you know, reach him you know try to reach his humanity but he also wasn't fucking stupid and he hacked jason to death and made sure he was dead as shit and as mentioned previously rob the hitchhiker was a fantastic character a missed opportunity in my mind but he was really great in this film i love the idea of one of the past victims 
uh, from one of the pa uh, from the past movies, one of their relatives coming back to avenge their death against their killer. It's a really neat idea, and he could have been a good, really great rival to Jason, like I said, and could have been his yin yin to Jason's yang. Unfortunately, he 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 was killed, and that's a shame because if he wasn't killed, he could have been a really good rival. That could have moved forward and could have been someone could have been a protagonist we looked up to because we would have sympathized with him in his plight he didn't have as many moments to shine as a character but i feel like he had a lot of good uh he had enough moments to where he was a very heroic character especially with his backstory and what he wanted to do and trying to hunt down jason i cared about him i cared about his death he's one of my favorite characters in the movie and I wish he had lived because it would have been a great idea to continue his story and kind of be like the Dr. Loomis, you know, he's the Dr. Loomis kind of type to Jason's Michael Myers type. You know, it, it just would have been a nice yin and yang. And finally, we have our hockey mask wearing killer himself, Jason Voorhees. How was Mr. Jason Voorhees in this film? He was fantastic in this movie. Jason was fucking awesome. Jason was, of course, played by Ted White, who is my one of my favorite Jason actors. He's the I still he's still, he's not my ultimate favorite, but he is one of my favorites. And I think you know I I think Kane Hodder still holds that space, but Ted White is fantastic. He really nails Jason, and I feel like. He, he did what the other Jasons didn't and really gave Jason a lot of personality and character, especially anger. Like, I could feel Jason's anger throughout this movie. He made Jason scary and threatening in this movie, and I love the way he just portrays Jason in this movie, how he's fucking uh, angry at everybody, and he's pissed off. And uh, I think somebody told him that this was his final movie because he fucking killed everybody. He had no filter. He didn't give a shit. The kills in this movie were fantastic. Of course, they were done by Tom Zavini, the legend himself, who was in the first, who did the effects of the first movie, and he did not hold back. He gave us a great, you know, great uh, special effects for the kills because he did an amazing job as always. They were very creative. They were set up well. I showed a lot of kills in this movie, you know, uh, with Paul getting, you know, stabbed in the dick. Um, the win throwing out the window kill, Jason, uh, you know, stabbing Jimmy with the corkscrew. Just so many fantastic kills in this movie. I was never bored throughout this movie because the kills were fantastic and really well done. This is Jason at his best. This is what Jason should be. A bunch of creative kills against these fucking horny teenagers. And finally, I really like the setting and the atmosphere of the movie as well. I think it was gr really great, too. I like the two houses in the middle of the woods and, you know, the dark, rainy night. You know, it really helps sell the mood. It makes this movie very tense and suspenseful. And the music does a really good job of misleading you into thinking you're safe when you really aren't. You think one moment that Jason isn't around and, it, you know nothing's going on and it's just you know a scene of characters you know uh talking or doing something and then jason pops out of nowhere and fucking surprises you it's really well done the music was fantastic and it, the setting and atmosphere was just fant uh, fantastic because because like i said the whole two houses in the middle of the woods and the dark rainy atmosphere like all these movies have you know this is what we want out of a Friday the 13th movie. Good atmosphere um, that gives us great suspense, great tension, and we feel for the characters. It only sells it more when, when we're anticipating the next kill. Overall, guys, I would recommend this movie to fans and newcomers of the Friday the 13th franchise. It is easily the best movie of the franchise. It is my personal favorite Friday the 13th movie. Some may argue Part 6, Final Chapter or part four, as we should really call it, is really my favorite in the franchise. It's my personal favorite. It give, it provides a satisfying ending to Human Jason. It gives you everything you want in a Friday the 13th movie. A good Jason, good characters, good kills, good setting and atmosphere. 
just has everything you want. It's not a perfect movie, but again, no movie is. It really happens, and I'm not looking for perfect in this movie. I know Friday the 13th the movies are going to have some of its flaws, but this movie was perfect. And had this truly been the end of the Friday the 13th franchise, while I, while I would have been disappointed that you know there wouldn't be any more movies, I would not be disappointed in the ending. But of course, that did not end up happening because we did eventually get part five. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the review. Please give it a like if you did. Comment down below your thoughts on this film. Do you love this movie like me? Do you think it's one of the best Friday the 13th movies uh, out there? You know, do you think this is the best of the franchise? Do you, you know, think this is amazing? Do you hate this movie? I, I, I would be interested in that as well. Like, what makes you put off by this movie? You know, uh, what, what puts it down for you? Like, what makes it not a good experience? Uh, or are you just somewhere in the middle where you think it's okay, but it's nothing special, uh, but it's nothing bad either? I'm curious for your thoughts, so let me know. And subscribe for more Friday the 13th content like this, or if you're just interested in any of my other content. I'll have more Friday the 13th reviews on the way. With uh, and Actually, in a couple months, we will have I will be uploading a Friday the 13th Part 5, a new beginning review, because there will be a Friday the 13th in December. So look forward to that because that'll be happening and I will go into my thoughts on that movie. But of course, I love Jason and I love the Friday the 13th franchise. So each Friday the 13th, we'll be reviewing more Jason movies. But if you demand more of them, of course, we will do more of them. You can also follow me on Facebook where I have discussions about things we talk about on both my channels and Twitch where I hope to live stream in the future. So in my next video, I will continue Scooby Month with a new Scooby Doo Movies review. I have no idea whether which episode it'll be, um, because this is being recorded ahead of time. And of course, this is being uploaded in September during Scooby Month. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little special Friday the 13th review during Scooby Month. But yes, there will be uh, an episode review of one of the new Scooby Doo Movies. Whichever that one is, I hope you guys enjoy it and, you know, look forward to that. You know, Scooby-Doo is a big part of my channel and I love talking Scooby-Doo. So if you're interested in that as well, you know, come check it out. Uh, it, it should, it'll be a good time. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed my review of Friday the 13th Final Chapter and why I believe it's the one of the best, it's the best of the franchise. And join me in a couple months where we will be reviewing Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning with the copycat Jason. Oh boy, that'll be an interesting one to talk about. The one where they tried to move on without Jason, but it failed. Well, we'll see how I what I think about it when we go into it in December. So join me then and uh thank you guys so much for watching this video. And as always, peace out.